what surprised me was how strong intensity it had. And it was moving slowly around in the field. It was stopping on some locations, standing still, hovering about the ground, sometimes also having spotlights out of it to the ground and also up. It continued like this, moving, stopping in the same area for more than one hour. I think it was close to two hours before it suddenly disappeared. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. That was Professor Erling Strand. He has been in Hestalen, working the Valley of Hestalen for decades. I'm very excited to have him on the show today. Professor Strand is a system professor. He's at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. That's where he graduated from. He's been at Osfold College of Engineering in Sarpsborg since 1977. Erling Strand also is a member of Two interesting groups we'll go through. The first is called UFO Data. That's with Christopher Mellon. That's an interesting group we'll cover, as well as ICER. ICER is another interesting group from Europe that is pushing for extraterrestrial disclosure. Professor Strand is also the SSE European representative. So that was from 2007 to 2013. That's at scientificexploration.org. And why we're talking to him today is he was the project lead at Project Hestalen since 1993. He was the project manager, is the project manager. The project investigates anomalous or unknown phenomena in the Hestalen Valley in Norway. I've covered two other episodes of the Hestalen Valley previously. Check out my previous videos on the Hestalen phenomena. Hello, Erling. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you. Excellent. You are calling from Norway. Yes. Where are you in Norway right now? Well, just now I'm not so far from the main capital where I'm living. Also, it's about 500 kilometers from my home to Hestalen Valley. So it's some hours driving to get there. And how many years have you been going to Hestalen? How often do you go there? I started my first tour to Hestalen was back in 1982, where I had the very exciting sightings. And after 1982, I've been to Hestalen many times, several times a year. And after I started lecturing at the university college, I also brought my students up there. So. There has been also a lot of students together with me up in, in Hestalen. Okay. And you, yeah, you mentioned 1982, right? Is this, is this you, I'm guessing from 1982? Yes. That's my first tour in Hestalen. It's actually taken some hours, a very few hours before my first sightings. I parked my car on that road. You don't see the car there, but we are, was walking from the car up to the nearest hillside it's to the left in the picture and was picking up our instruments and was ready for looking for the phenomena. Okay. So you went there with the intention of finding the phenomena. Yes. We was a group of friends who decided to go up to Hestalen to try to see it for ourselves, because, well, back in 1982, it was so many happenings or so many sightings up in that valley. So the press, the newspaper started to write about it. And many people went up to the valley to try to see it for themselves. And many did. And I and some friends decided to do the same thing, hope that we could see something. So that was the weekend in September, 1982. This is actually that photo, right? 
So this is the photo. That's I guess that's the hill side you were just mentioning. Well, that photo is uh, taken from by a friend of mine who was located on the, another hill than I was. We was split in three different places, so we could cross correlate. And if we saw something, we can tell the direction to the other groups and to find out where it could be. I was on hillside, well, to the left in that picture and the other group, in fact, was closer to it. And he managed to take several pictures, good pictures. And the third group was located on the hill, which couldn't see the same sightings as we did. What surprised me looking at the phenomena, and first of all, it was surprising that we managed to see the phenomena already the first day or the first night. So we, we was of course exciting. And what surprised me was how strong intensity it had. And it was moving slowly around in the field. It was stopping on some locations, standing still, hovering about the ground. Sometimes also having spotlights out of it to the ground and also up. It continued like this, moving, stopping in the same area for more than one hour. I think it was close to two hours before it suddenly disappeared. And that made a big impression on me because it was the first time I saw it up in the Hesnaun Valley, saw the, this light, and it was obviously something there. It, it wasn't any doubt. And we could, you see, see the mountain in the behind, in the back of it. And so it was obviously something in the valley. You mentioned there was other, there was another team there. So they, they took the photos. Were you able to determine exactly how far away it was and how large it was? Well, the size is approximately three meters in diameter. The distance, I don't remember exactly now, but some few hundred meters <clears throat> from the, from the site. The location I was, I was a little bit farther away. I would guess a little bit more than one kilometers away from the, from the light phenomenon. And of course, this made a big impression, especially when also it seems to be some kind of light. I saw the light beam moving up in the air, but the other team could see it also a uh, spot light down to the ground and illuminated the ground. And we, did. we was up there a weekend. We arrived on Friday afternoon and we had this sightings on Friday. And we had also one that was looking after on Saturday, but we wasn't so okay at that time. But anyway, we managed to get it one great sighting. I mean, that's all, that's all we, we should need, right? It's one big sighting. Yeah. And when you see it for yourself, you can imagine you're standing out in the wilderness, uh, no houses close by, uh, and it's dark, uh, not any artificial lights nearby. And you see this great big light moving in front of the mountains that can be frightened, but I wasn't afraid. I was just curious, what could it be? And after I came back to my home, which was in Oslo, the main capital, about 400 kilometers away from Hestown, we followed it and 
read the, about this in a newspaper, and everyone thought that some research facility, some re research institute, some university, some, someone should do something <laughs> to try to find out what it be. The chance was quite good because the Heston, the location where it's happening, it's a small valley. It's about 15 kilometers long. At the most, we found out it could be up to 20 observation a week at the most, but that's max. So if you go up there, if you go up there with instruments, it was a pretty good chance to capture something. Mm. Well, everyone discussed that. Many people wondering why doesn't that research facility do something and so on. And then some friends of our, our mind, we come together and discuss the same thing and decided to, well, no one else do something. Maybe we should try, try to do something. That meeting we had, that was back nearly one year after my first sightings. And we made a group of five people who organized this project. We call it Project Heston. And during the autumn 1983, we collected the instruments. So we planned a field work up in the valley in January and February 1984. And we managed to run this, this field investigation closed. So I think it was nearly one month with up to maximum 40 people participated during that field work and we got data. Okay. Oh, that's, that's amazing. And when you mentioned the initial sighting. You said that this was, so around three meters across is, is what you guys estimated. And you said it was so bright, right? Well, can you talk about, I guess, the effects that you see? Is this normal effects for what you consider a normal sighting in the valley? Or is this a unique sighting? You know, it's very bright. And then you mentioned there's some sort of spotlight coming down. Can you just describe those two things? Well, the size of it is um, very difficult to say it's normal because it shows up in all different sizes, all different shapes, all different behavior and all different speed. You cannot have one description which tells about the phenomenon. You have, have to have several descriptions of what it is. And after studying this for some years, we have found that we, we can split the phenomena or we can categorize the phenomena in four different types. We have one type is the white or blue flashes, which can last up to maximum a couple of seconds, but normally less than one second. So it's very difficult to be aware of it. We wasn't aware of it, of that phenomena in the beginning, because it lasts so very short time. So we are not sure if it was something or not, but it turned out that this type blue or white short meshes, which are strong normally are one type and it's the type which lasts which is most of it. The second type is the yellow type, mostly yellow, born of light, some kind different shapes. As the first observation I mentioned was this type, mostly yellow, different shapes, different speed, can last for up to a couple of hours, but normally some minutes. And that is the one that was most, when you go up to Eston and look for the light in the beginning, it was that type of light you, everyone was looking for. 
The third type <laughs> is when you have several lights together. It seems that these spots of light are connected to something. And when that type of light or lights have been seen, when it's not completely dark outside, the witness say that the, these balls of light or the, these lights, which are connected together, it seems onto some black object. So when, when these are moving, all these lights are moving together. So it's quite obviously it's connected to some, something. That's the third type. And the fourth type is those mostly seen in the daytime. It's object type, which if you have more standardized you for looking, if you can talk about that. And it's not so much of that one. It's mostly the lights showing up and on one of the three different types and where the first one is absolutely most happening. Okay. Excellent. So what I understand is there's four main types that you're seeing. And so the, the first is basically the flashy lights that, that I showed there, which seems like, and we can, we have a few more videos of those to show where it, it's just like this bright light that comes out of nowhere and flashes. That's the first kind of uh, sighting that I understood. The second one is what we talked about on your first sighting is that long, I guess, long duration lights that move around kind of larger and they, you mentioned yellow, but I've also heard other colors. It seems like there's other colors, maybe red as well. That can also play a factor there. Yes. Maybe yeah, have, yeah. Well, it uh, just mostly yellow, but it can be other colors as well. So, uh, okay. And, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was, I just, I was getting a lot of sound. So we'll go back to the, and, and it looks like the second type of sighting is that kind of long duration sighting that you mentioned was, was your first sighting where it's just that, that long duration light and you mentioned it, it's yellow or white it can be yellow, but I also, I remember hearing from the other guests from Thomas and John Moen, who I, I already interviewed, that there's other colors as well, that it can change to red and then basically disappear or shoot a light up into the sky or blue lights, et cetera. Is that, is that correct? You have, you're seeing other colors? Yes. This low light type, even if it's mostly yellow, but it has also other colors. Sometimes it seems to be a mix of colors, but mostly yellow, but also other colors has been seen. Okay. And then, so that's the first two types. And then the third type is multiple lights. I, I found this quite interesting because it seems like there's these multiple lights that seem to move in some sort of relationship to each other. And I remember talking to John Moen. Jan mentioned that there was one sighting where they saw the lights and actually when the moonlight shined between them, they could actually make out a, a box, a rectangular shape object in between the lights. So I, I thought that was, that was quite interesting. That sounds like the third sighting. Yes. And, and you have also some kind of mix of the different, but the, those four types are, are the main one. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, the fourth one is where it looks like a UFO, right? I've heard that before. I think it was Jan's wife had a sighting. It's the most interesting sighting that, that I recall from that is while she was driving, she looked out her window and there was a flying Volkswagen Beetle, essentially. So a small object that looked like a ghost rocket that was basically flying with her car. So that sounded like, is it, I'm guessing that's the fourth type of case you, you, were, you were mentioning, which is rare. Yes, or you can also see that's not only lights, but if you see it an, an object type in the daylight in the daytime, actually. So it's all different 
kind of rapes and forms and speed and everything on that one as well. So, so that's it. The different types makes it difficult to find one solution which fit in all these different types. When we started the first field work with instruments up there, we believe that the well, we do some measurement, find some data, and hopefully we we'll have the solution. But that was not the case. Well, we got some data, but the data, well, it made this more mysterious because the data was so, some of it was so strange that it, we couldn't use the ordinary knowledge in physics to explain it. For instance, we have measured a speed of this light with the radar and the highest speed was 30,000 kilometers an hour. And that was so high speed and it didn't make any noise at all. If it had been some kind of solid, it would have been a noise. And uh, uh, we have measured the optical spectrum to find out uh, what kind of uh, elements it consists of, but it turned out to be some con continuous optical spectrum that's, that tells that the solid object type may give certain kind of optical spectrum. So, and then you have heat. So the optical spectrum tells it could be solid, but the speed without any sound say it's not solid. So we have several different measurements, which in a way point in different direction. We have also measured we could capture it on radar, even when we don't see it with our eyes. We could follow, we had the station up there with a lot of instruments, among them a radar running all the time. We could follow it on the radar screen, a strong go from the radar, strong uh, signature from the radar. We could see the lights, of course. But sometimes we could follow it on the radar without seeing anything with our eyes. But it was obviously something there because the radar said it was something there, but we couldn't see it with our eyes. Back to some witness reports, have seen it can show up from nowhere. And as it is materialized, as it comes out from nowhere, it, it's uh, just uh, show up and uh, not any high speed or something. So, well, there's a lot of similar stories, which or makes it very difficult to find one solution, which fit this, this, all these different data and cycles. Oh, it's very interesting. Yeah. So you're basically, you do have a lot of data. That's, that's what I've, what we're looking for, right? Is is good evidence, good data for the phenomena. It sounds like you have a lot of data, but the data points in different directions. So it's, it, it, it appears to be a solid, but then it also doesn't make any sound and can move as fast as light. So it, it almost like has a duality, if you will, like a wave particle duality nature to it. But you mentioned here your, uh, about the data. Your website, it seems excellent. Hestalen.org is actually the, uh, the website. So I just went there. So if people want to see, I found they have pictures and videos, right, from all different years here. So going back, I saw you 2004 to 2010 is blank, but otherwise you've covered, you know, every year since 1999. 
with pictures and videos. Here's an interesting sighting just from the year 2022, just to give people an idea of what's, what's on the website. On the 24th of October, 1.45 a.m. at the UFO camp up at Hestalen, observers Janique Rowe and Lynn basically said they see a very interesting light. You know, it looks like a star that's kind of moving. I, I think what you're talking about, where you have some, some light that isn't a star, it's not a shooting star, right? Didn't look like shooting stars. There were plenty of them that night too. Had no tail and went straight down, not in an arc. So if people want to reference the data that you're referencing here, they can go through it and check this out. So I, I thought these are interesting too. If we just click on one of these videos, let's see, I'm just picking on a random video. And here's, here's what we're talking about. Interesting lights. There we go. There you know. So that's just a random one. Let's pick one more to see. Okay, that's that flash you're talking about. So if we look here, you'll see just a bright flash there. You know, right here. <laughs> you know, what is that? I don't, what that, is that flash? <laughs> These pictures or videos are coming from the Aphmatic station we have put up there. Okay, that is the, that's the blue box, right? I think I showed that earlier. Yeah. So you went up there, you saw your sightings in 1982 and then started a expedition, 83, 84. You figured, we'll just go up there, we'll get the data, we'll solve this, prove the existence of extraterrestrial life and move on, right? It'll be uh, just a few yeah. weeks of work. And what I you found uh, is a little more complicated. Maybe I should uh, also mention that we had the field works in 1984 and then 1985. Most data was coming from 1984. After 1985, we got only one good sighting. So we believe that has stopped. This is from the station in 1984. We uh, believed it had stopped, but so we actually didn't do any more field works after 1985 until yeah. I was up there in Hestalen to tell them what had happened with the data we got gathered back in 94 and 95. And that was in 1993. That was eight years since we were up there. And then we, everyone believed, or I believe, that there was nothing more going on. But after my presentation, where I told them about the growing interest among scientists and so on, I've been to different conferences to talk about it. And one of the inhabitants came up to me after my presentation and said, well, it still continues. He said, I was very surprised because I hadn't heard anything. And I commented on that, well, I haven't heard anything. Is it still going on? Yes, it is, but we don't tell it anymore. Because we were so much ridiculing in the first year when we told about our observation that we decided to stop all the talking about. Well, I thought, well, maybe I should start a project again. And at that time I was working at the university college and I used my students to build an automatic station cameras and so, so on. It was a blue, it was, all the equipment was put it in the blue container and we called it the blue box and it's still in operation. And every morning during the night, it's recorded a sudden light showing up and take a short video of it and a picture and send it to the hestong.org website under alarms and those, most of it are false alarm or you can explain it, but some of them are, which I will consider interesting, could be the phenomenon and those videos and pictures are put in another folder, which are called pictures and a year of pictures and 2017, for instance, then they can go into that on the, from the website and go into that folder. I look 
at the, all the pictures and videos which has been captured that year. So uh, that's uh, And also on the website, you will find also stories from witness, people who tell about their observation. Some are taking pictures as well. And we have written about their sightings and that could be also be found on the website. You will also manage to find the report back from 19, first field work, 1984, where, where we had all these different strange measurements, the instruments, readings, which are really, I call it strange. It didn't point in one direction. So <clears throat> that report can also be found on the website. I could also mention that due to the fact that all the different data, some of it could point in another direction, different, different types of direction. Is it solid? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it, well, you have the different data and different description or in different direction. So it can be difficult to find one solution. Could it be several different things we are observing in the Heston Valley? Is the different the description, the different data, the different thing? Do they measure different thing? Isn't it the same thing? It's easy to think in that direction because of the different type of data. But the big question comes then, why does all this happen in a one small valley in Estonia? So that point to the fact that I will say this is, must be something in common. Could it be one solution? And if it is, it will certainly give, if we find out, the solution, or when we find out, we'll probably have some new basic knowledge about our nature or, or whatever you call it, and new knowledge about the phenomena. I know. That's yeah, I, not I noticed here you have uh, interesting, you say a solution is found, right? So these reports, a solution is found. What, what have you found is the most common solution? You know, what first is your first point. thought? Yeah. The first observation, this station was put in operation 1998. So these pictures are from that first period of observation. And in the beginning, we, we, the solution could be, for instance, maybe, or we can say it so it's, it's a probably solution, which are marked with the blue dot there. It could be, for instance, a plane. It can be a satellite. It can be a something known phenomena. Those who are not uh, so easy to find an explanation on, on the first year, I marked them with a yellow. Now I bring, bring them, I don't have the marking of yellow or blue anymore. The blue one is presented on new latest pictures. Only bring those who are yellow in the first one, though. They're not easy to find one solution. It doesn't say that all these presented here is the phenomena, but they are all so in a way that it's not so easy to find one solution. And if you look at the, the different videos and pictures, which has been captured by the automatic system, you will see that most of them, you can see a flashing light, which <clears throat> lasts less than a second. So that's the common. And I guess for that flashing light, there's no, what's, what's the best mundane solution? 
you know, for the, for the flashing light. I mean, what, could it be a drone? I don't even know what it, what it could be up there. You know, is the, I guess, what is the possible solution for this, for this flashing light? Could it be, you know, are there humans out there tricking us or is, is it some other factor? Any ideas? No, we, d we can just say we, we don't know what it is. Yeah. And sometimes this can happen as this can happen there on a site to where it's not so easy to be located. So it's not any person going out with a manacle or anything, night flash or anything. It's, it's uh, happened so short time and you see the shape on it also. So if you study it, it's, uh, it's a still a mystery. And you have studied it. I also, talking with Thomas, he mentioned, and John mentioned the white boxes as well. So from my basic understanding, again, I don't have deep understanding of this, is that the white boxes tend to get more information from ground events, such as electromagnetic or high energy events. Have you noticed or seen any, any related high energy events or other radio, radiation that, we, that we're not expecting? Well, first of all, we are running the blue box. The white box was built during uh, what you call the science camp to have education for the students uh, taking part in the science camp where we train students to go out in the field to do a scientific investigation. The white box doesn't have any connection or bring out the data to the public. It, mostly take part sure, when it's students running science camp one week a year. We are talking about the blue box. We shouldn't mix the white and the blue box together. I see. So it's a totally separate program and it sounds like th that information is not released publicly. It seems like it's, it's kept private for some reason. Yes. They're collecting data when, when yes, it's, um, it's not official. The blue box, I decided to, the blue box, I wanted to have a scientist to get involved. So actually I put all data of fission at once. I don't keep it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the best way. Yeah. I think that right away. Best. I love the way you have it where the, the videos go straight to your website. So they're already uploaded on the website and then from there now. You can go through and analyze to see, hey, which videos are interesting or which videos have an easy answer. It's just open source. I, I totally agree. I think this is the only way that we can move forward, you know, in this, in this field is, is the open source sharing. Is that because of the stigma? You mentioned a few times in here, you mentioned the stigma is a big issue and that was what stopped a lot of the investigation at the beginning, right? Or at least in the, in the public sphere. Can you talk a little more about the stigma? Do you think it's, is it going down now that we're seeing this, these 2017 yes. articles? Yes, it has going, gone down because in the beginning, when we started the project, if you study UFO, you were, many people thought you were nonsense or whatever. You, you wasn't taken seriously. And when I was up here back in 1982, I was a researcher myself, we worked in my profession. And when I talked about this to my companions at my job, they say that you shouldn't involve in studying this UFO topic because you wouldn't be taken seriously. <laughs> it sounds like me with NFTs. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah. What are you doing? It's yeah. Yeah. Yes, but, yeah. but the, the opposite from those who said similar such thing that I had seen it myself, so I knew it was mm -hmm. there. Uh, but anyway, the stigma, uh, the people who was seeing this, the inhabitants in Hestown was ridiculed in the press and they took it seriously. They was uh, upset, of course. You can imagine you are living in a valley where you see this strange light moving. Sometimes can be close to your house, moving outside your windows. 
a big light illuminating even the room inside you. Right. Because you're, you're, and no one managed to tell you what it is. And instead of trying to help them to, to find the solution, they start to ridicule you. That's nonsense. That's, that's so, but anyway, that, that happened. Hmm. I think the step in the right direction was taken when we, we managed to have scientists from different countries come together in Heston, having a workshop in Heston, discuss the f uh, phenomena itself. And some of them were famous scientists. When the press saw that the famous scientists attended Heston to discuss this phenomena, they thought, well, maybe we shouldn't ridicule it anymore. And I believe uh, this, this ridiculing stopped very much after that, when scientists took this seriously. So now I would say that ridiculing is not anymore. It's, it's free for people to tell what they see and tell about their stories and their experience. And that, of course, that's, uh, that's very good because you have to know what's happening. You have to get the stories from the people together with the data, of course, from instruments and so on. You have to get the right data to find the solution. Also, didn't, didn't J. Allen Hynek go there? Well, right before he died, did, didn't he come up to Hest Island? Did you work with him? Is that what you're mentioning? Yes. We, he visited us during our second field. We had the first one in the winter of 1984 and the second one in the winter of 1985. And then Heineck took the tour from the States to visit us up in the, in the valley. That was really right. very good. That was in 1985. Yes. And, and so what did he, he think? What was his assessment of the valley? Well, he said uh, the Hessland Valley is a UFO laboratory. It's a place where things can be studied and things can be well worked in. We had a meeting at the university in Oslo together with, the, with the people from the military, together with Heineck, and we decided to, he would help us. When he come back to the States, he should gather some scientists to, which could help us to find the, the solution or work in the phenomenon in the way. But sadly, this was the year after he died, passed mm -hmm. away. That's very good. Okay. So he had planned to come back and investigate further in Hestalen. Fortunately, he, he passed away. You mentioned scientists collaborating. I found two interesting websites here. The first is UFO data. So UFO data, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, there are for, for UFO data is a group of people, scientists who want to find out what's behind this UFO phenomenon and they want to do well, much of the same thing we did in Heston to bring instruments out in the field and also uh, so we could get the scientific data so it's possible to discuss what it can be. That's one group. And we have also other groups which uh, are more... as well. Oh, it was interesting. Yes, that's, a, that's another one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a group which we there you are here. Yeah. yeah, we want to get this in the United Nations office there. We are have collected the people from many countries, I think 30 countries around the globe. And one of the goals is to get the topic itself, you for topic, into the United Nations and you have watched what you call Project Titan. People can read about it. Uh, 
if I get an office in the United Nations, I think it will help a lot mm -hmm. because then we can organize better all the different organizations, what to do to find a solution. So there's a lot of good ideas are out there. I think the progress in, in the research itself is very good. It's better now than it was before. Yeah. Because you know, we, there are several people, clever people from different locations around the globe, different professions. You have university people, you have scientists. So there's a lot of good people with, which have the right researchers. So I have a good view that the progress in getting the real interesting data goes much faster than it was before. You know, uh, if you got the right researchers, uh, my project has on the instruments has been on a very low level due to the fact that we don't have so much money to get the right instruments and uh, manage to do real uh, good research. We have some though, but it could have been much better. Uh, and I think have you heard of this, Erling? I'm sorry. Have you heard of have you heard of Sky360.org and Richard yeah. Hoff? Yeah. So what's your what do you think of the program? Do you think that would that would work or that would increase the the evidence, the data? Yeah generally I will think it will actually mm -hmm. and, uh, all organization, all, all the people who do work out in the field where things are happening, to go out and get the data, yes, have a good chance to, to get the right data. So this is one, one of them. And there are also other, other organizations which are doing the same thing. And so uh, Project Test Down has a cooperation with the Ornithing organization and uh, make a scene where you can discuss and share knowledge. Uh, and I think that is very go good. You have, uh, you have, uh, uh, um, Project Test Down is a member of uh, two such organizations which work together. So I have a... Uh, Great uh, view in the future of such research, and I still so you're, you're optimistic. You're optimistic. So you're I'm optimistic. optimistic. Uh, so you've really? been out here when everyone thought you were crazy. You must you must feel validated now that there's actually some movement. In your, yeah, and optimistic. It, I'm I'm very glad that the work of oh. all the different people who are doing such kind or research or trying to find the correct data and go out in the field and do investigation that these people, they got, we got more of them. We got more well-educated people also who have their knowledge and such will it make it easier to, to get a good progress in this research. And also remember this data will, I, I think you have to need to think outside the box <laughs> to find the solution. And if you are willing to look at the data and listen to the observers and take a notice of what they're saying. And willing to think outside the, your box, you will, you, when you find it, when we, someone is finding the solution, it may get a right step forward. It's very important to find this, what it's all about. I agree. I mean, it's, yeah, it's so interesting. Thanks so much for your time, Erling. Thanks for your dedication over the last 30 plus years to this.
and for making this amazing website that we can all we can all gain from. So I think yeah, if, talking to the the other in interviews I had with Runa, I think that yeah, that the team is is building, and I only see us kind of finding more information and getting more data from here on out. So glad, great to meet you, and and I hope to meet you in person up in in Norway in Hestalen to hopefully put in some some additional systems there and try and get some more data on this. So thanks for your time, Marilyn. Anything else you want to say or any last word? Any last word? Yeah. My next uh, people who want to take part of it, if they go into the website hestalen.org, they will see the new steps we are going to take now. We are connected a group of good scientists, good people who will dedicate much of their time and topic to the, the we call it the new blue box. Yeah. You're planning to have yeah. better instruments and so on. And if, if people want to follow up, all of us on that one, they could, uh, we have a Discord server now, which the people can attend. And I think there will be even a presentation very soon. So it's possible to, to take part of it. Excellent. Yeah. So if people want to get involved, go to the Discord, I think it's called Project Hestalen. Yeah. Discord. Yep. And the links on, on the website here and hestalen.org website and very exciting. So yeah, thanks again. Thanks again, Erling. And I hope Thank you. Uh, it's all luck. Have a Thank great you, day. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay. Amazing interview there with Erling Strand. He's been out in the Hestalen wilderness. You saw there, it's not the most welcoming terrain up in Norway. They made many captures over the years. Check out that website, check out hestalen.org. Quite an interesting website. You can get lost in there. Look at the, all the different videos they have. There is data out there, so there is evidence. We have no solution that can answer, actually answer the questions. But we are dedicated to finding out. And you just heard that from Erling Strand as he's dedicated as well. He's working into the website. He's building another team and they're working on a new, a new blue box. So we should only hear more information come out of Hestalen. Please like this video to get that information out and then subscribe so you get notifications of when I put out updates on Hestalen. So we'll definitely keep you updated. And to get backstage access and further support the channel, go to patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. You can join all these amazing people. Don't forget about UAP Society. We're launching our product. You heard Erling say there, no one believed him at the beginning, thought he was crazy for looking at UFOs. And look what happens. Looks like it may actually be a reality. Same thing with NFTs. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Peace.